Throughout this course, I've been fascinated by the art of the ancient Greeks and how their artistic formulas and motifs evolved through the archaic, classical, and Hellenistic periods, and how these artistic formulas and motifs virtually mirror Greek culture and society. My research paper examines the evolution of ancient Greek formulas and motifs through the mythology of one figure, Perseus. Of course, the story of Perseus has many characters that share the spotlight with our hero, and they will be examined as well. I'm going to begin by just briefly describing the mythology of Perseus. Um, it's a very long and, uh, some would say, convoluted story, and it's woven into many other mythologies. But briefly, he's the son of Danae, a mortal woman who was impregnated by Zeus when he was rained down on her in a shower of gold. The story opens as Perseus is flying over the earth in a pair of winged sandals. He encounters Titan Atlas, who refuses to let him enter his garden because he's afraid Perseus will steal the golden apples growing on his golden tree. So Perseus pulls the head of Medusa out of his bag and turns Atlas into a giant mountain. Perseus then flies over the land of Ethiopia and sees Princess Andromeda chained to a rock and flies down to free her before she is sacrificed to a sea monster. Perseus battles the monster and kills it and marries Andromeda. During the wedding celebrations, Perseus is asked how he killed Medusa and he tells his tale. He tells how he stole the single eye of the three weird witch women and went to Medusa's lair to kill her. He looked at her in the reflection in his shield and was not turned to stone. When Medusa's blood landed on the ground, two creatures sprang up, Cryosaur and Pegasus, the winged horse. In ancient literature, uh, the story of Perseus is told by an average of 21 different ancient writers. Um, my favorite is Hesiod. He describes Perseus in lyrical, beautiful terms, and, and uh, I just love how he describes Medusa. She dwelt in the uppermost west, beyond glorious ocean, in the frontier land towards night, where evening's clear-voiced daughters are. <laughs> Ancient artistic themes and motifs for Perseus are um, fairly, fairly static, although they do vary a bit. Uh, popular themes and formulas are Perseus and his mother, Danae, Perseus fleeing from the Gorgons, which are Medusa and, are, and or her twin, her two sisters, Perseus before, during, and after he decapitates Medusa, Perseus in the presence of Athena, Perseus and Pegasus, Perseus and Andromeda, and Perseus and the sea monster. There are specific artistic motifs that identify Perseus, and they are his winged shoes, sandals, and his cap of Hades, which makes him invisible. He also carries a cabesis, which is a highly decorated gold and silver bag, and Perseus hides the head of Medusa in the bag so that she, her head cannot, her gaze cannot turn anyone to stone. Um, in the artwork he's depicted with, in the early uh, artwork, he's depicted with a straight sword, and later he is shown with a harp, which is a curved sword that resembles an obscenian sickle. Um, he also has a mirrored shield, and the characters that are related to the story is, of Perseus are, the main characters are Medusa, Pegasus, Andromeda, the sea monster, Athena, and in the archaic period, um, because the story of Perseus and the depictions of Perseus are so tied to culture, I've given an overview of the history and events during the archaic period and also culture and society in general. Um, developments in social, political, and religious organization occurred during this period. The polis was developed, which was the political city-state. Um, citizens were organized on the principle of citizenship. Uh, expansive colonization and trade around the Mediterranean region. And this produced economic growth and agriculture and trade. Uh, culture and society, the Hellenes see themselves as separate, unique, and culturally superior. 
their it's their political system is an oligarchy and the trade encourages ideas, ideals, writing language, religious beliefs, social customs, and new inventions in language and writing like the alphabet, uh, mathematics, and science actually help with um, freedom of expression. Uh, epic poetry is developed, lyric poetry, architecture, sculpture, vase painting, and artistic techniques and styles are highly influenced by trade and migration. The art of Perseus during the Archaic period, I've provided six examples. Uh, the earliest is um, a freely modeled on the neck of a large reddish colored clay storage vase. Perseus is identified by his conspicuous cap and the cabesis hanging from his left shoulder. He's also depicted turning his head away from the monster he's ready to slay. Uh, this is the only known depiction of Medusa with the body of a horse. Um, scholars argue that this depiction might be from a local legend or might be a reference to the origin of Pegasus who sprang from Medusa's blood as she was beheaded. The face of Medusa is not terrible and frightening. In fact, the only element that really identifies her as a monster is her two rows of enormous teeth. The style of this um, storage vase has low reliefs that are freely modeled, and this was common in the Greek islands. There is uh, oriental devices used that are strictly profile and frontal views. Bodies have more naturalistic forms, and they're, the patterns and textural clothing and florals um, are naturally filling devices like the scrolls and the lizards. Um, what's interesting is Medusa is pretty much always seen frontally in the Archaic period, and Perseus is always seen in profile. The next example is a clay relief of an early gorgon with a monster's head and a human body. And this was thought to be a decoration on the corner of the roof of a temple. This is an interesting interpretation of the Perseus myth because it excludes Perseus, but it includes Pegasus under the left arm. And the mythology of Medusa is that she, when Perseus decapitates her, out of her neck springs Perseus and Cryosaur, these two figures. So you can see on the right-hand side this um, reconstructed area under her other arm, and it's thought that possibly Cryosaur would have been there in that placement. Uh, the face of Medusa in archaic art is wild and frightening and fearsome. She has huge, uh, huge ears, a broad nose, <clears throat> fangs, wings, and um, stylized, the curled hair is meant to be stylized snakes. The interesting thing is she's in this position of um, running or flying. This kneeling pose is meant to represent fast running or even flying. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second example is a, a beautiful um, black figure Dinos that is actually three feet tall. It's a bowl with a stand that's a splendid example of the full first black figure technique. <coughs> Pardon me. It features a combination of animal style friezes, geometric patterns, and early Greek expression. The mythology of Perseus is almost completely represented around the top of the bowl. Athena and Hermes watch as Medusa falls headless to the ground, and her two sisters chase a fleeing purpose, uh, Perseus. All of the characters are represented using their specific motifs. Perseus is depicted in profile, adorned with the cap of Hades, his winged sandals and straight sword. Hermes carries his herald's staff, and the Gorgons are depicted with their bodies in profile, running, and their heads, of course, are face to the front, so their fearsome faces can be seen. Um, the black figure technique is perfected in this, um, this beautiful bowl. The decorative bands of animal friezes and stock patterns are dry and static, yet the true Greek spirit can be seen in each figure's movement and lively expressions. 
depictions of Perseus fleeing from Medusa and her Gorgon sisters becomes a common theme in this period. Um, and I have to wonder, is this meant to convey that even a hero has reason to be terrified of these hideous creatures? The next example is uh, a really beautiful ceramic tripod, and it, it shows a falling headless Medusa and her two Gorgon sisters chasing a fleeing Perseus again. Um, this actually has the same four scenes that Hesiod describes in his poem, Shield of Heracles. It has Perseus and Medusa, a festival, a wrestling match, and a rabbit hunt. And um, I think it would be interesting to do some research and see if this was designed to be a visual representation of Hesiod's poem. Again, Perseus is identified by his capped wing shoes and cabesis, but the sword is missing. As is common, he's depicted in profile. The Gorgon's bodies are also in profile as they run after Perseus. However, their faces face front and their hideous features are clear. Um, this is a black figure in the Attic tradition, and the figural representations follow common formulas. But here there's a definite sense of grace and elegance. Um, the figures are more elongated and delicate. I love all their little pointed toes and their long fingers. And um, it just makes them more lively and fluid. And also the Gorgon's bodies now are depicted as females. You see curved hips and waists and, and they're wearing skirts too. So. The next vase is one of my favorites. Um, it's a black figure jug, and this is by the Amasis painter, and he's considered one of the most accomplished craftsmen or artists in the archaic period. And this vase marks a new phase in vase painting where the artist begins to show a great degree of naturalism. The Perseus, the Perseus myth is depicted in a new way here, representing one episode in the myth rather than try to tell the story with many figures in a frieze. Uh, the episode that the painter has chosen is the most dramatic because it's the moment just before Medusa's death. Hermes watches, unaffected by Medusa's stare, and Perseus holds the curved harp to her neck. Um, this is an advanced black figure style with highly detailed naturalistic figures. Uh, the figures are arranged in a group with the mythological heroes surrounding the monster. Medusa is the central figure, and her imminent death is reflected in her terrible grimacing stare. Even though she's depicted in a frontal pose, her knees are bent as if she's trying to jump free of Perseus's sword. Perhaps the star of the show is all of the finely detailed decorating and patterning in the clothing, Medusa's wings, and border accents. It's just beautiful. The last face I want to show you in the archaic period um, is really an advanced stage of figural representation because the, the forms are so naturalistic and the gestures and the draperies are so beautiful. For the first time, the figure of Athena takes a central place in the narrative. A rare landscape is present in the low mountains that occupy the space under Perseus as he flies through the air. He's dressed in the cap of Hades, and he has his cabissa slung over his shoulder. But for the first time, he carries a harp, a curved sickle-like blade, and not a straight sword. The Gorgon sisters are refined, and like the other fig figures, they are dressed in, in beautiful drapery. Um, Athena and Hermes have an elegant, refined bearing, and this is a sure sign of the coming golden age in Greece, because you see a natural increasingly natural figures and gestures. Draperies are extended with long incised lines and zigzags that both elongate and define the folds and patterns in the fabrics. The earlier battle narrative that featured a fearsome Medusa and her Gorgon sisters is replaced with a serene poetic narrative centered on the gods, Athena and Hermes, and the hero warrior Perseus. The, this late archaic vase painting shows a clear progression from the previous stylized conventions that were commonplace in the old tradition. Next, we're moving to the classical period. This was the Golden Age of Greece, and Athens defeats the Persians in the Battle of Marathon. They assume uh, leadership of the Greek alliance in the Delian League. The rule of Pericles begins, the Athenian building program, the Peloponnesian Wars, Plato founds his school, the Academy. 
Philip II is king of Macedonia, and Alexander the Greece is the greatest king. Um, during this period, there is expansive colonization and a massive military. There's increased innovation in political systems and policy. Um, Pericles' ideologies bolster Athenian pride and accomplishment, and artistic ideals are reflected in Athenian patriotism and advancements in intellectualism. Expansive building projects include prominent monuments in the Parthenon and literary and artistic achievements like tragic dramas and historical writing begin to flourish. The art during the classical period <clears throat> begins with a beautiful red figure water jar um, with new artistic innovations. You see a much more dynamic fluidity in the figures, varied compositions, and for once, the narrative is read from the right to the left uh, instead of the left to the right. Um, even motifs of the characters have changed to make the story more poetic and intellectual and psychologically interesting. Uh, the figure of Athena follows Perseus as he dances forward after slaying Medusa, and her diagonal spear moves the eye down to Medusa, who has fallen dead onto her delicately po posed fingers. Uh, Perseus dances freely and with confidence as he looks back, unafraid to sur survey his victory. Um, breaking from the artist uh, archaic tradition, this early classical Perseus does not have a beard, and his cap has a large has large elegant wings on the side. Medusa too is changed. She is shown headless and is no longer the fearsome monster. Instead, she is treated like the other figures and looks almost human in appearance. Her head can be seen in Perseus's cabesis, and her hair has become dark curls. Her snakes are gone. Archaic stylistic conventions have been changed from black figure to red figure design during this period, and the narrative is much more intellectual. Elements of mathematics and science, like composition and perspective, are present, and the figures are much more naturalistic, and the characters are given new motifs to en further enhance the story. In 450 to 425, um, this is a very interesting depiction. Uh, it's a red figure design, and the narrative is read from the right to the left, but the composition is more subtle, um, supple, and fluid. The details have been reduced to just bare essentials. And the figures really have a very quiet nobility that is both detached and untroubled. What's most interesting is that Medusa is no longer a hideous monster. She has human features and is depicted in the innocence of sleep. Athena bends to help the hero as Perseus creeps up with his harp and bag, ready to deliver the fatal blow. The scene has a, a very quiet tension to it, and in this depiction, Medusa is almost innocent. Her eyes are closed, making her mute and helpless, and the viewer is not confronted with her monstrous gaze. The red figure design is maturing into this perfect style in the golden age, and the approach to the story has become a subtle sensibility that abandons the actions of the event in favor of the moment of suspense that precludes the drama. The figures are tranquil and dignified and lovely, and even the monstrous Medusa has lost her ugliness. What I find so interesting about this is that Medusa almost looks like a victim here. I mentioned that earlier. Her eyes are closed, which, you know, her eyes are her biggest weapon. They turned men to stone. So she really has, in this space, been turned into a very helpless uh, figure lying there on the ground, ready to be slaughtered. The next vase is also, it's just one of my favorites. I think it's so beautiful. Um, it's a red figure vase that really does exhibit the full measure of classical beauty. Medusa is depicted as a beautiful winged woman who peacefully sleeps and is unaware of Perseus and Athena and her imminent danger. Uh, this is another interesting device where the story is not told in a series of uh, battle scenes or running or things like that. It's almost captured in one moment in time right before this main um, point of drama, which is the actual event. Um, Perseus looks unwaveringly at his protector Athena, and you can't see him in the photograph here, but rays actually surround the hero's head, which indicates special stature or power. 
and he's taken on the role of the aggressor in this. Um, the refined naturalistic figures give the scene a calmness and serenity, even though he's ready to chop off Medusa's head. The figures are beautifully modeled, and the poses and gestures are relaxed, poised, and naturalistic. Even the monster Medusa is made beautiful and serene. The draper is also realistically rendered and falls gracefully over the figures. I really love that there's a quiet, retrospective piece in the narrative, and the artist has captured the moment before the upcoming violent action. The, the last vase that I want to look at in the classical period is, um, is a narrative on a mixing bowl that reads from right to left, where Athena holds the head of Medusa, and this is a, a, an uncommon scene where Athena is actually the central figure. Um, she seems to be unafraid of uh, Medusa's murderous gaze, but what's so beautiful and interesting is that the artist was able to capture the reflection of Medusa's head in the shield at, uh, per at Perseus's feet, and the perspective is right. It's upside down. I think that's just beautiful and very interesting. Um, Perseus gazes down as if he's studying the reflection of the monster in the shield, and uh, he's almost, uh, it's almost a restrained victory scene where Medusa's head is held up as the prize and the, the hero and, and others stand around in this beautiful kind of look what we've done moment. The beautiful decoration on the top and bottom border of the bowl frames the scene. Um, the subdued, elegant style of the decoration also adds balance and refined naturalism to the narrative, too. The figures are standing in varied contrapposto, which is quite beautiful, all in balance and harmony with the tale of the serene victor. And the figures are beautifully naturalistic and proportional and relaxed and refined. And even though there's no action other than the action of the contemplation, I think this is a very powerful intellectual piece that, um, that really talks about, to me anyway, the search for truth and beauty and harmony. The last period I'm going to talk about is Hellenistic, and during this period you have uh, Alexander the Great, who is um, has, you know, has such uh, blended such an amazing through his conquest an amazing mix of Greek and indigenous traditions during this time period, and you have King Ptolemy who established the museum in Alexandria. You have more wars with the Gauls, and of course the death of Cleopatra appears during this period. But what's most interesting is that Hellenic, Hellenistic society is divided by, by class into the kind of the same uh, class structure that you had in the archaic period where you have uh, the upper class elite, then you have the wealthy elites, merchants and laborers and slaves. And um, Alexandria, of course, was the leading intellectual center. And you have cosmic, uh, comic dramas appearing, poetry, scholarly research, libraries, manuscript collections. And during this period, of course, the sculptors and painters sought to portray emotion and drama using diverse subject matter. The advancements in philosophy, mathematics, and science also and um, there was an expansion and diversification of religious practices as well, which highly influenced the art of the period. Um, the art of Perseus during this period, um, I'm going to look at four different examples. And the first one is um, a wonderful vase. I, I, have, I didn't see any scholars that enjoyed this piece as much as I did, but I think it's fabulous. I, I love everything that's wrong with it. Um, it's a, a red on black ground design, and um, it, it really does show the profound changes that occurred in the artistic production after the death of Alexander the Great. Local traditions and private commissions gave way to these mixed, um, and like I said, some say degraded style of this period where... Um, the artists just don't seem to be as accomplished and polished because you're you're dealing with such a mix of indigenous people and cultures and ideas and religions. Um, 
but in this vase you have Perseus carrying Medusa's severed head as he flees from Medusa's Gorgon sister. And in the drawing on the bottom you can actually see Medusa, which is wrapped around the other side of the vase at the top. It's, she's just sitting there calm as could be without a head on a rock. And her sister's flying through the air with these ghostly arms. It just reminds me of a modern horror movie. And, of course, Perseus is looking back, you know, fleeing from this apparition behind him. But, um, you know, every figure does appear cartoonish, but I think that's part of its charm. I, I know that the original painter, the intention was probably to create heightened drama and, um, you know, almost the fright of being pursued by this ghostly, monstrous creature. But I think it's um, I think it's just truly charming, and 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 I love the amateur amateurish childlike sensibility and the um, the unproportionate you know beauty that's going on. I just think it's so funny. Uh, the next one is Andromeda and Cassiopeia with attendants, and. The story of Andromeda doesn't appear till later, during the Hellenistic period. There is one very, very early and very rare appearance in an archaic vase of Andromeda, but artists until the Hellenistic period just did not care about the love story between Perseus and Andromeda. They wanted to display the action and the war and in the archaic period, and of course, this beautiful refined intellectualism and psychology in the classical period. Well, in the Hellenistic period, they're experimenting with emotion. So, of course, now we have the love story between Perseus and Andromeda. The figure on the left is Andromeda on a throne. And the story is that her mother, Cassiopeia, brags that her daughter, Andromeda, is more beautiful than than one of the gods. And the god gets mad and unleashes the sea monster and is told that the whole city will be destroyed, the whole society will be destroyed by the sea monster unless Cat, um, Andromeda is sacrificed. So, of course, Perseus sees Andromeda tied to the rocks and battles the sea monster and kills him. But um, the style, you can see that they, it has a lot of classical aspects. It has beautiful proportions. The drapery is somewhat accurate. But at the same time, you have all of this emotion where Queen Cassiopeia is on her knees, reaching out to her daughter, and, and outside the scene, you don't see Perseus and, and King Cepheus there, but they're there, and they're watching over this drama unfolding between mother and daughter. Uh, the next one is a later depiction of Perse Perseus and Andromeda, and uh, Andromeda is bound, awaiting her deadly fate, and Perseus is below and battled with the dreadly, deadly sea monster, and of course there's a little Eros figure on the back of the sea monster. But, um, you know, what's so interesting is that you have such beautiful drapery and decoration and all of the, the details of this this face painting. And, you know, even though the, the monster's body, body is finely detailed and, and everything looks right, it, you know, it's still a little bit off. It's still kind of a, it just doesn't have that beautiful balance and proportion and harmony of the classical period. There's a lot more drama going on in effect to fill every space with all these watching people and watching the scene and of course, Andromeda's tied to this rock, and her father's next to her watching the, the battle. And it's just, you know, more of the same drama and theater. Um, the last uh, example that I want to look at is uh, an actual Pompeian wall painting. And I think it's worth mentioning because it's thought to be after a painting by Nicias, who was an Athenian of the second half of the 4th century BC. So the original artwork was mentioned in the writings of Pliny, and there have been several copies of this original. This is one of several copies that were done in sculpture and mosaic and coins. In this scene, you can see a lot of the classical elements. Um, you know, Perseus and Andromeda are dignified and stately, 
and according to earlier tradition, this painting does not seem to add to the prominence of the two figures, you know, Perseus' sword and Medusa's head are, are you know, very inconsequential there on the right. Um, there's not a whole lot of drama with those, with those elements, and you really can't even see dying Medusa behind uh, Andromeda's rock. The figures are very refined and collected, and there's restrained emotion, and, and the, you know, for the most part, the figures are proportionate and elegant. And even though this is a later copy, I mean, I, I think it would really provide a very valuable clue to uh, the sheer beauty of a, a classical painting that has been lost. In conclusion, it's really easy to see how uh, the style of art, you know, just examining it through the mythology of per uh, Perseus, but the style of art really changed from one period to the next and, and was really a virtual mirror to um, culture and society of the ancient Greeks. You have all of these developments in the archaic period and breaking free of, of these... Um, orientalized devices like full frontal and rigid profile views and highly stylized designs and patterns and and then you see how artists begin to experiment with increasing naturalism and which involves of course evolves into these beautiful figural representations that even though they follow common formulas they start to show uh, increasingly natural figures and gestures and of course in the classical period you know, all of the, um, the intellectualism and science and philosophy and the search for, you know, truth and beauty and, and perfect proportion and, and um, getting closer to the gods through this beauty of form um, is exhibited in the art. You know, the, the figures are beautifully modeled and the poses and gestures are relaxed and poised and natural and and, uh, of course, that gives way in the Hellenistic period to society and culture that's, that's a mixed, really a mixed bag of Greek and indigenous traditions where you have, um, it's just a melting pot of ideas and ideals and religions and artistic traditions. And, and all of this mixed bag really did produce some very beautiful, expressive art that, that, that was so individualized by locale and by tradition. And so I just think that's so very interesting. So I hope you enjoyed my presentation and um, that's it.